EPCO Educational Topic Number 23, Third Trimester Bleeding. Bleeding in the third trimester of pregnancy can range from spotting to life-threatening hemorrhage. Remember that at term, a woman's total blood volume has increased by 40% and her cardiac output has increased by 30%. 20% of cardiac output goes to the gravid uterus, so significant bleeding can be quickly catastrophic. The objectives of this video are to list the causes of third trimester bleeding, to describe the initial evaluation of a patient with third trimester bleeding, differentiate the signs and symptoms of third trimester bleeding, list the maternal and fetal complications of placenta previa and placental abruption, describe the initial evaluation and management plan for acute blood loss, list the indications and potential complications of blood product transfusion. The causes of third trimester bleeding include placenta previa, placental abruption, preterm labor, uterine rupture, and vasa previa, as well as vaginal or cervical tear or laceration from intercourse, cervical polyp, or severe cervicitis. We will focus on the first two on this list, placenta previa and placental abruption, in this video. The first five causes can lead to serious neonatal and maternal morbidity and mortality. The last three on this list are considered the benign causes of third trimester bleeding. We are all familiar with the ABCs of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Don't forget, in a pregnant third trimester patient with bleeding, there needs to be another B for baby. Remember to always assess fetal heart rate status as part of the initial evaluation of third trimester bleeding. Once you are assured that the patient is stable and that there is a reassuring fetal heart rate pattern, then a careful history should be obtained. Here, the PPQRST mnemonic is helpful to frame your questions. P, is there pain with the bleeding? P, placenta, has she had a formal ultrasound during the pregnancy that assessed placenta location? Q, quantity of bleeding? R, recreational drugs during this pregnancy? S, sex recently? And T, the timing of the bleeding? Then move on to the physical examination. Look at the maternal vital signs. Again, remember to assess the fetal heart rate. Ensure that there is good IV access if you are concerned about heavy bleeding. Look at the skin carefully for petechiae. Palpate the uterus to assess if it is soft, hard, or tender. Remember, do not perform a cervical examination until the placental location has been confirmed. A speculum examination can be performed to visually assess the cervix. Let's now discuss placenta previa. Here is the uterus with the external os, internal os, and endometrial cavity. A complete previa completely covers the os, whereas a marginal previa partially covers the os. The classic presentation for placenta previa is painless vaginal bleeding. Placenta previa is diagnosed by ultrasound. Remember that with a placenta previa, a digital cervical examination should not be performed for digital manipulation can cause bleeding. If there is heavy bleeding, volume resuscitation, and possibly beta-methasone for fetal lung maturity. The management of placenta previa must balance the risks of prematurity with the risks to mom of heavy vaginal bleeding. Delivery with a placenta previa should be performed via a cesarean section. Let's now discuss potential complications with placenta previa. There can be bleeding from the lower uterine segment where the placenta was abnormally attached. In addition, there can be abnormal extension of placental tissue. Placenta accreta involves extension of placental tissue into the superficial layer of the myometrium. Increta involves extension further into the myometrium, and percreta involves extension completely through the myometrium to the serosa and sometimes into adjacent viscera. Note that the depth of invasion corresponds to alphabetical order. These three abnormal placental extensions are associated with significant bleeding and morbidity. Caesarean hysterectomies need to be performed for these three conditions. Let's now discuss placental abruption. This is an abnormal separation of the placenta, and the classic presentation is vaginal bleeding with abdominal pain. Here is the placenta that is normally attached to the endometrial wall. If this starts to separate with a placental abruption, then there is usually painful vaginal bleeding. Note that there can be concealed bleeding if the blood is trapped behind the placenta and cannot exit. The term cuvalier uterus refers to the extravasation of blood into the uterine musculature, which causes the uterus to appear purple or blue. Risk factors for placental abruption include trauma, such as a motor vehicle accident, domestic violence or fall, cocaine use, hypertension, and multiple gestations. The diagnosis of placental abruption is by clinical examination. The management of placental abruption involves monitoring of the vital signs, fluid administration, close monitoring of fetal heart rate pattern, and delivery for severe hemorrhage. Note that abruption is the most common cause of coagulopathy in pregnancy. Let's conclude this video by discussing evaluation and plan for managing acute blood loss.
Obstetrical hemorrhage is one of the leading causes of massive blood transfusion along with trauma, ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, and liver transplant. Massive blood transfusion is defined as a transfusion of greater than 10 units of packed red blood cells in 24 hours. Remember that one unit of packed red blood cells is approximately 200 cc's of red cells and should raise the hematocrit by approximately 3 to 4 percent. A key point to remember is that oxygen delivery is greater than four times oxygen consumption, so there is always enormous reserve. So if intravascular volume is maintained during bleeding and cardiovascular status is not impaired, then oxygen delivery can be maintained until bleeding becomes too excessive. This is why it is so important for our anesthesia colleagues to aggressively give IV fluids during a hemorrhage in order to maintain this intravascular volume. In cases of massive transfusion, if only red blood cells and crystalloid volume are administered, then there will be dilution of the plasma clotting proteins. The 1 to 1 to 1 ratio reflects a ratio of 1 unit of fresh frozen plasma to 1 unit of packed red blood cells to 1 unit of platelets. Let's take a step back to discuss when do we decide to give a blood transfusion. We have to consider the risks of transfusion and the desire to avoid an unnecessary transfusion in this discussion. In cases of massive hemorrhage, the need for transfusion is great in order to avoid significant morbidity and mortality. In less acute situations, the patient's overall health status and blood counts will help with the decision making. In general, when the hemoglobin is 6 to 7, a transfusion is recommended. Between 7 and 8, then a transfusion should be strongly considered. And between 8 and 10, a transfusion is needed generally only if the patient has symptomatic anemia or acute coronary syndrome. The risks of blood transfusion that must be considered are the risk of infection. The risk of HIV is approximately 1 out of 450,000 to 650,000. The risk of allergy or immune reaction and risk of volume overload. The final point to remember with third trimester bleeding is to remember to give Rogam to RH negative moms. This concludes the APCO video on third trimester bleeding. We have discussed the causes, evaluation, and management of the most common causes of third trimester bleeding and the management of acute blood loss. Music